of things that I really, I really have, since I've been reading this book, fallen in love with is having a tiger shark mouth on the P-40. But keep in mind, not only was it a popular thing on the P-40, on a P-51. In fact, if I remember right, Al Rabe had it on his P-51. And just looking at this book, there's so many examples of this. This would be a great thing to have on the I-Beamer when we get to that point. Look at that face. Think about it, Banjack. We could have matching, <laughs> matching tiger shark mouths. No, oh, I love these books. This is a classic shot, by the way, down at Steve DeJulia's cellar. Here's Palco and Banjak working on their two Mustangs. Hey, and with this, let's get busy. Enough fun for one day, enough inspiration. Now, these are the 13 fours, and what I have, I have my, my little gauge here. This goes on the pen. And I go over to the grindstone, and I have all the diameters that I've tested already marked on here. Now, what I want to do, I want to make myself up a 13-4 cut to 11 inches. And remember, that'll have extra area at the tip. Let me see what Nixon wants. Now, what I always do is I try to do this. I try to go up to the belt sander. It, it serves two purposes, is I can take a little bit of diameter at a time, but I can also see... For instance, if the end of the blade is a little bit of an angled in, angled out, I want it to be perfectly parallel to the line. And of course, I have all the diameters, and I can work up into any diameter. I just did an interpolation. What I want to do is make one up at 11 inches and see if that's going to overload the motor before I go on and make a whole half a dozen of them up. Coming back to the gauge. Let's see how it up. Reverse it. One side. One side. And you can see I'm exaggerating this. I'm a little bit of an angle this way. What you can see by doing this is how thick of an airfoil section you have out at the tip. It's really thick. And the next thing, of course, is to finish it, take off all the finish, and rebalance it. Well, I won't even take the finish off. I'd like to go get, uh, actually, it looks like a reasonable day to get a test flight and run up to the field, get a test flight, 
a couple of test flights with my square one prop and see if this is any improvement. If it is, I can make up a bunch of them. If it isn't, we'll make one up a little longer, a little shorter, make one with a Phillips entry, whatever. Anyway, this will be a good test. And this is the hard part of developing anything. This is the part that's labor intensive. Once you have the numbers, you just go and replicate it. It's so easy, it's ridiculous. But this is the part nobody wants to do. Okay, and after that was balanced, of course I kill the corners, radius the corners just a little oh, this dust a little man. Radius the corners a little bit. And I'll kind of take a right up the field, see if I can get a couple of flights before I make up a whole bunch of these props. Because if this turns out to be the prop of choice, I want to have plenty for testing. Now this is kind of typical. By the time I drive up to the field, I got raindrops all over the windshield. Well, the testing's going to have to wait, and that's just typical for this time of year. Now one of the things I learned over the years, and I try to do religiously, is whenever I have a day that's a rain out, a blowout, the air goes bad, something else, I try to find something I can do that'll be of some value so that when a nice day comes, I'm already that far ahead of the game. Now in this case, these are all props that I've tested. I've made little notes in my notebook. Again, a 10-6, I'll keep a spare one. This is for anybody that's at the field and wants to try it. And the BYNOs, until we can get a reasonable supply of them, it's pointless to keep checking them. We have some cut down, some nicked, some we've repaired. We only have one in this we borrowed. It's not even our prop, so I don't want to disturb it. I want to return that. The AHMs, marginal, not as strong as the wood props. And now we're going into the evolutionary phase of trying to get the diameter and the tip width up. And again, if you look at this, the one thing you see is as we've started the experiments and we've constantly load, every one almost loads the motor more and more to the point where we've almost got it right. And I think we're real close to having it right. And I wish we could do this now if we had props, let's say zingers, or let's say another brand of prop, we could zero in by finding too much motor load, too much of a, an acceleration factor, motor over, and we could kind of narrow it down to the one or two props that would be the best choice. But the whole purpose of this, again, is when Woody has his plane ready to fly, and I understand he's already got three flights on it, that we can say, okay, Woody, there's the prop that worked for us. This one was a little weak. This one was a little fast. We can go through this. Now, we've already done this so many times. We've already made dedicated videos on props for 60s. The guys that run tuned pipes have to go through this even on a much finer scale because the higher of an RPM you're running, the more critical getting that pitch right on the razor edge is. But for our purposes, getting them just ballparked in like this is certainly sufficient. And even on a rainy day like this, we can get a little bit ahead on our prop work. Now, one of the things I always do, you can see some of these props have little nicks and tips, and we've chipped them and nicked them and whatever. This one here is nicked. This is a good time to get out the prop balancer since I'm going to sand down some more of these big wood props and carve up some props. While I have the, the prop balancer, I take my whole bag of props and usually I'll keep all the props that fit one airplane or one motor in one area and, and just start at one end and make sure that they all balance. Make sure I haven't picked up chips. The, uh, these are ones I know that when you take one little chunk out of these, especially at the tip, and this one looks like it's already been whacked, these, are, because they're so heavy, they go out of balance relatively quickly. Now, the wooden ones seem a little more tolerant to it. This, I think this is the one Carlos nicked up. Now, you can see now, it's a good chance to get out one of those Bud McKnight sanding sticks, dress these edges off. In this case, the pink ones work real good. You could dress the edge up real nice, get a little touch-up paint on there or some CA, something that'll keep it before you even do a balance, make sure it's smooth at the tip. All of this little maintenance, a rainy day like today, we can get ahead. Now, who the heck wants to get to the flying field and be doing this? And you see people doing it every day. They wait till they get to the field to do their maintenance or wrap lines or adjust the handle or something. Do it now. And again, once I take the prop balancer out, it only takes about a minute to do 10 props. This one was good, this one was right. Oh, that one, gee, I picked up a stone. Oh, something's a little out, or 
if you have these tips exposed, what can happen? A little fuel can get in there. Now they're out of balance. You need to clean it up, dress them off, whatever. All of this maintenance, it's good rainy day maintenance. Now what I like to do is when I get a, a Ziploc bag, a sandwich bag, all, once the props are balanced and actually ready to put on a plane, I like to keep them stored in a plastic bag or somehow so that they don't get all chewed up and scratched up. See, a lot of people, they throw a propeller in a toolbox with pipe wrenches and dynamite sticks and everything, and by the time they take it out, it's all full of nicks and chips. And if you have custom painted props where they have the letra sets in them, you need to actually wrap each prop in a plastic bag, but give it some kind of protection. Now we just got a call from the glass place, our glass tables are in, glass tabletops. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to use the old dining room table up here. And this is something a lot of people never realize or they never really think about, is we can use a bigger table here. You can see we got quite a bit of room. We can use the tabletop area. And basically, the, the other choice would be we just have to throw the table out. Now whichever table we can't use, we'll donate to Ken's foam shop, but this is always using up old furniture uh, you can see every piece of furniture in here is something that came from the garbage this is some way this is a way you can uh, improve your shop and basically put the salvation army out of business now, these are the bases that we had bought in south carolina and we're we're going to try like hell to make these the bases for our new dining room table karen put an antique finish on these we changed the finish, we didn't like the finish, we added stuff to it, we marbleized it, and finally reached a point where, uh, well, she's satisfied with them anyway, and that's the main thing. There's an old dining room table, this is the one we're going to dump. Now if we were, if we weren't going to use this, this basically would go to the Salvation Army, but it's a little bit larger than the one I have downstairs, so I'm going to try to fit it in place and try to use it for whatever, if I can use it for a modeling table. A lot of people I know throw a table like this out or they donate it to the Salvation Army or whatever and then they wonder, you know, I need a building table, I don't have one. Now even if you didn't want to scuff this up, you could put a hollow door or something on top of it. And what's happened is we put a lot of work into this dining room since, since the last time Kajeski put the door in there for us. And we think the glass tabletop with the pedestals is going to just open a room up just a little bit more. And of course, Karen being the decorator, uh, <laughs> the decorator from heaven. Anyway, we're going to rip this out, put the pedestals in, and see if this will fit in the shop. this table has two extra leaves. I only got one leaf in. I don't even know if I can put the other one in. And it's added a nice dimension, especially if we're going to be building. I, I assume we're going to be caught up on our housework soon and start having Monday night every night. This will be a nice work area. Actually, two people could work at the same time. It also, when you have a rack like this, this is an important thing. People walk by and they bump into it all the time. So this table being here, now they have to walk around it. They tend not to just bump into it. Four or five times we've had somebody walk by and catch a rudder with their shoulder or a tail wheel with their nose or something. This totally eliminates that. And it's that word that we love so much in modeling. F-R-E-E. -E, free. Ah, Karen's big day has finally arrived. All her work antiquing these things. We're going to get the glass table delivered. The guy just called from the glass place. This is a three-quarter inch, eight-foot piece of glass. They need four guys in a special truck to deliver it, so we're really looking forward to seeing that. And also, I know, I know you all. <laughs> I know Catherine Vans was sick of looking at this stove when it was all in pieces, but hey, the final product. We're just waiting for the glass top. It's all going to be delivered at one time. The wine rack in the back worked out okay. Anyway, one of my nice little projects that uh, Karen and I shared the labor on, and this is 
This is or was very labor intensive and we're just waiting for the glass guy. I'm going to polish up the brass and we'll be ready. Stewart. break that's some piece of glass holy Christ I never seen a piece of glass this thick in my life Once wow I've seen a lot of it I gonna I got a feeling I will don't don't put anything hot on it <laughs> without a coaster. this yeah, is my wife's dream wow without a trivet or anything yeah to the heat will crack it yeah if it's real hot yeah and yeah. somebody's sitting under it wow that's not a beautiful bevel and everything wow we got a double bevel on there yeah double facet now when Karen comes home, she is going to be so happy with a glass table with the beveled edge. Oh, she's going to be so happy. Anyway, got to show you. Now you know if you watched all these, and I'm, I'm sure all the women in the world, I'm sure uh, Mrs. DeJulia is probably saying, let's see how that stove worked out. Look, he gets to eat the first meal. This bum. I don't even get to eat on this I'm thing. I'm making the first one though. And your mother gets to polish the brass when she gets home. We still have to get the stools. The stools are coming from Canada. Custom made stools. Look at this Stewart stove. And just remember the main thing. It's a Stewart. Oh, I'll tell you. I hope you guys appreciate that I, I go to these lengths to uh, entertain you. And look at that wine. All we need is wine. Yeah, I just realized we don't drink wine. Maybe we could put jars of olive you don't oil. Drink wine. <laughs> we could put jars of olive oil in here instead. I don't know. This was a labor of love. Truly a labor of love, the steward. And that's always my philosophy, no matter what you do. Try everything and decide for yourself. In this case, now he's got a tune pipe set up and a normal engine set up in the same plane. And you can make a comparison which you like the best. When you go taking other people's word for things, hmm, it's confusing. Sometimes you just have to come out to the field and test. And that's what we're here to do today. It's not a good flyable day again. You can see we're, in fact, it's a little on the chilly side, but one of the things we do have, we got some new props to test and we have an all new muffler. Now, for anybody that's never seen one of these, this is a new Brodak round tongue. And this one, this one fits a K and B 40. So the first thing on a list of things to do is to get a square one reading. This is the setup that we've been using and kind of settled in on. And I want to get a needle valve setting on this. Now once I get a needle valve setting, then what I want to do is, and get a couple of flights, I want to put this muffler on. Now if I have to go in on a needle, it'll mean this muffler is more restrictive and I'll need to open up the hold some. What'll happen if I have to go out on a needle, then I know this muffler is less restrictive. And I can, I can compare, I'll have one other test thing. Plus I think this will make it a little more aerodynamic in some degree. The thing that's negative about it is I'm trying to get the weight lower in the CG so I can reduce the tab. And this muffler will do exactly the opposite, but it might not do it enough that it matters. And we can get a gauge on how the motor runs with both mufflers on the same day with the same prop. Like the 51 better or the pipe? Tell me the truth. 51 is definitely better. 
The truth. Now you're under oath. Raise your, raise your hand. You're on the Bible. <laughs> I swear to God, I will never tell a lie, Abraham Lincoln. Lie. That's what it belongs, for sure. That looked a lot better with that. Uh... Oh, it pulls, man. The other yeah. way, I mean, it pulled, but it didn't really have that heavy pull. But you know what? You have to try them both and then decide it. for yourself. That's exactly. the only realist. Gotta... If you just take somebody's word for it, you're fooling yourself. Yeah, well, you got a cut-off version of Mike's? No, this, I took the back off because it'll fit in my toolbox. I've Mike got... Stooge is the best is one. Yours or bike? No, that's mine. Mike made it, Mike, but it's... Mike copied your design. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I bought one this year. They work well. Oh, it works beautiful. Perfect. I haven't had I haven't had a problem with it yet. Don, the way that stooge works with the pin, I like it better with the pin, but the way you have it, you know, I'm not. Straight out. Did you see these yet, Don? No. Round tongue muffler. What the hell is that for? You can get them right from Brodak. Big Art makes them. Wow, it's like a... Uh, it's for a profile, hey, that's really. really. neat. It's for a profile. I'm going to try it today. First, I want to get my square one flight in here. Gee, that's all right, man. If it fits a 51, you can try it later. I don't know if it fits. you got to take a that look. That replaces the tongue muffler. Yeah, and it's, it stays right up against the engine, so it's not... See, on a tongue muffler, it's sitting way down, so it changes the vertical CG, so... Right. it would be interesting to try it today. But I want to see is how it flows, if it's going to need to go in on a needle or out yeah. on a needle. But that, I'm sure he makes them for 51s and for 60s and everything. So if you're interested in trying one, yeah, if it doesn't fit everything. on, just buy one from Brodak. I got to get his new catalog. He, he, I got a real old one. I got an expansion muffler on there now. Yeah. yeah. The Adamison. Yeah, this is, this is made by Art Adamerson, too. Yeah, yeah, it looks like his style, that, yeah. that dulled finish. Yeah, it's sandblast. Yeah, All his stuff is well made. That's pretty neat. An interesting thing they did is they had a contest here Sunday, and I think it got rained out, I'm not sure, but they put up these poles, which if you wanted to, if we were going to try to fly some elaborate stunt patterns that they'll be preparing for a contest, you can put them, you know, six, eight feet away from the edge of the circle, and you can see the four to six foot height as you fly by. So it's good for training. It, it serves a purpose now. I, I see there's two or three of them up the field, and I see they did the same thing to the flagpole. So anyway, it'll be of some value when we start doing stunt patterns. But right now, what we're really interested in is getting some testing on this. And as always, what we really want to do is the first thing, get a square one going. The next step is going to be, I have that, that prop cut, this is cut down to 11 and a quarter from a 13.4. This is a really wide blade out at the tip, and before I start playing with the mufflers, I want to get a couple of runs on this just to see if this overloads the engine, I'll go home and cut an eighth of an inch off the blades. Well, after a couple of flights, hey. Counting the dandelions here. It looks like we have a new square square one prop, this wide blade prop. And this is a 13-4. Cut down to a little over 11. This looks like we have a new square one prop. So being we have a square one prop, we want to use this one to test them off those with. Now, a couple of very predictable things happen during this testing. Number one, with the larger diameter prop, there's more prop out at the tip. And it's that last inch, remember, that really counts. Forget about, forget about all that stuff at the hub. What this prop is doing is slowing down the turn just a little bit, so a couple of the things I want to test, I still have a half ounce of nose weight in here. I can see if I can make that up by taking out a little bit of the nose weight. Also, a very predictable thing that happens with all engines all the time. When you load the motor more, you have to back out on the needle a little bit. In this case, I've been going out about two clicks on the K and V needle each flight, and I've got it back to where it, uh, actually where it should be, where it's in its, its range, where it's 2.4 and a little bit, a little bit nicer than it was because I wanted to see how much extra of a load this prop put on, and it was a considerable... When you deal with that extra little, last little bit of prop, that's where all the work is being done. And with the needle out, we're just about using the four and a half ounces of fuel during the flight. So 
another choice, another choice you always have is when you're using a bigger diameter prop, we may, before the day's over, go up, open this handle up one notch. I don't know that we're going to really need it, but we have that choice, and we have the choice of taking out a little bit of nose weight. What we can do, in effect, is by doing that, we can speed up the controls a little bit and make up for the, the bigger prop load, which usually a bigger prop load will hurt the corner a little bit. Not always, because a lot of times you get more drive through the square eight and more drive on the hourglass and actually make it better. Again, that's what a day of testing is all about. If you come out here and try to fly stunt patterns, mm, you're just band-aiding over problems, band-aiding over. When you come out with the idea of really doing some testing, a lot of times you can go home with a better setup on the plane than you got to the field with that morning. And that's what we're trying to do right now. By the way, this profile, when you fly the plane, it's the side view of the plane is really nice. It really accents the maneuvers from the pilot's point of view. really good tip. I always keep several Allen wrenches with me at all times. What happens is after tightening bolts and mufflers and things like that for a certain amount of time, this end wears out. And if you sharpen it on a grindstone, you need to grind away, say, an eighth of an inch. But the trick is to sharpen it, run it real slow so it doesn't get hot and be tempered as steel, and keep dipping it in some water. You just want to grind, dip it in water, grind, dip it, you, and then you, for all purposes you have a brand new wrench. You're just wearing out that edge all the time. And always, always have a spare one. Now, the one that I know is sh is soft, I'll keep that in this box, and I know this will go with things that have to go back to the house for maintenance. This box is the one I'll use. In fact, this one looks like it's starting to get worn out, too. I hope I have an extra one. Yeah, or I can always use one of the little ones, because I want to start doing the muffler test soon. Right, it's warming up now. I try never to do my testing early in the morning when it's cool, because what happens is you always get these amazingly good readings. Motors make more power in the cool weather. You get these incredibly good horsepower readings. I like to wait, and it, it's getting up in the temperature range now. So I think we'll have a valid test here before we do this muffler test. And again, we don't have the one from Randy Holcroft yet. That'll be an interesting one to test. Having that tab out on a wing is real helpful when you want to change the vertical CG. You make a little correction, just reach under there and bend it. It's real nice. You don't run any risk of ripping a flap horn out of the wing, and the flap horns stay good and solid. And I see a couple other people have uh, basically joined us here, so we're going to see if we can play through some of this time. Anyway. You can see this guy has been well used. We did tap out some of the outside holes so we can vary the back pressure or for instance if we need just a little bit more mileage we can plug up one of the holes. But basically the way we got it from Bill Mazzoni it was in pretty pretty good tune I guess good is the right word. That is a very interesting piece. This is made by Big Art and you can see it's probably made with profiles in mind and the way that it exhausts. This should be an interesting test. Now, if it works out that this becomes one of our final pieces, we'll want to buff it up, polish it, whatever. And it'll give us a chance to clean this, but we'll have two good choices at the end of the test. So, before the air goes completely crazy, it's well on the way to going crazy. Let's get a couple runs on this. Oh, it's nice, of course, about a profile. You can make these changes and there's no cowling to fool with or anything. But even if it's more restrictive or less, whichever the case may be, one of the things we want to have is some variation. In fact, it looks like I got... Let's see if we got the right screws here. We got screws with this. What happens when you sandblast it, a lot of times there'll be some sand down in the screws. Okay. Not to worry. And it might even be good to run a tap down in there the first time before you try to mount it on a plane. Again, none of these things constitute a real problem. 
Good idea too to have a set of 440, 632, 540 caps. Real inexpensive investment. For doing these kind of on the field little adjustments. Now the trick is when we start the engine for the first time, the engine's got a pretty good load on it with this prop. We want to know if we have to go in on a needle or out on a needle to maintain our motor run. Another way to do this would be to run it at maximum power. Just try to see how big of a number you could get on a tack. And then do the same test with this in a dead two cycle and see how much it was restricting it in a dead two cycle. Just as there's certainly a lot of ways to measure a muffler's restriction. Since we're not using a pressure fitting, it really doesn't even matter at this point. But I will eventually tap this out for pressure fitting so I have that option whenever I want to use it. And there's no substitute, no substitute in the world for doing the testing. So many people, they, they read about things and you, you hear about it and you find out they never had the box open. And it's always good if you can to either videotape it, and the second best choice would be to write all your notes down on a little piece of paper. Now, I don't know, I guess we should run these with the holes in the back. Or we could try it both ways and see if it makes any difference. Now, if you run it this way, I, I'm, I'm wrong already. What's going to happen? The back's going to fill up with oil. So let me reverse this. Know the truth. You want to buy that engine? <laughs> I sell you that one right there. Uh, it's, dead it's, dead stock. Stock. it's dead stock. It's dead stock. No, it's dead stock. It's dead stock. It's dead stock. Yeah, I'm trying to get it to run like a tiger, and it it's close. Cool. It's not like it. Now, another couple of gallons of fuel, we'll know for sure just how. Now I got a couple of runs on this, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to go home. I want to open up the holes, maybe one drill size. What it is, just rough numbers, is Mazzoni's tongue muffler has 20 holes. This one has 10. This one is letting the engine breathe a little freer with the big prop load. This one is a little quieter. I needed to go in on the needle just a little bit. But I think if I open up these holes, just one drill size, I don't know what they are now, I'll be right at it. This is just a little for my setup. See, now this would probably work if you were running a 10.6. But the way I'm running the motor really flat out, it really needs the extra holes. And even, even of the holes that we have here, the ones that are tapped out, you can see are considerably, well, considerably bigger. Now the way restriction works, if you add up the swept area in all these holes and made one big hole, you would have a lot better gas flow. As you make the holes smaller and smaller, for a given amount of swept area, you add wall area. And where you have restriction is in the walls. So what happens in a case like this, you just defeat the system by having so many holes that it doesn't matter. But again, I think this one, for our purposes, and this is a personal thing, this is not like saying this is a bad muffler. What this is is something that would be sufficient for some people some of the time, and for me, Right now, under the conditions we're flying under, this is a, just a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is finish out the day's session of prop testing and things with this muffler. But when I come back to the field next time, I'll have this one opened up, and I'll have two choices. By the way, this one is just a little bit heavier, so with this one, I could take out a little bit of nose weight if I wanted to. And that's the reason to have all of the hardware sitting in the box ready to go, and fine-tune it to suit your identity individual identical flying needs you see don is not happy with tune pipes some people are very happy with them it depends you got to evaluate everything yourself or try to get as much information as you can but still make the final decision on your own an expected surprise came out of today's test session was just how good this prop is working so what i'm going to do obviously the next step is go make the same exact prop with the same Phillips entry. This is a Phillips entry prop, by the way, with maybe a little eighth inch more blade area and make one an eighth inch less. 
so that the next time we come to fly we'll have more props to tune. It's amazing how much you can get out of a plane that you really think is marginal when you get the prop right. Oh, it's, it's an amazingly good feeling.
Well, the idea of all this testing is this really would apply to any plane, a Banshee or whatever, or even a high-end plane. But one of the things we've really dialed into the fact is this, this motor likes to turn this prop. With either one of the mufflers, it's been a good combination. And I like to have, now, from this point, I'd like to get a couple more flights. It seems like I could even push this envelope a little bit further. Yeah, Don's got the jersey in out now. Another plane he's done some several motor tests in. And believe me, there's no substitute. And believe me, if you pick up one thing off the video or off what you've learned from my hard luck life, test everything. Get all the information you can from everybody's video, everybody's information. Boil it down, but in the final decision, Make your own decision. That'll always work best for you.
again, we're taking our turn and the uh, notice, notice the kind of respect I get. Everybody stays in the chair, they let me go pick up the plane. They know I'm here doing the, oh God, I'm so tired, getting old. Anyway, we had a pretty good day of testing. Really shouldn't complain. You can see that gallon of fuel is almost empty. That's the test of did you really have fun today? And we do have some new Square One equipment and we have some good information on that round tongue. This was a real productive day. Supposed to be doing. Former member of the Ukrainian Mafia, Augie Buffalano. Look at this. Are you using are you using a Bud McKnight sanding stick over there? Let That's me see it. that sanding stick. That's what it is. And I chromed it. Chrome. Chrome oh. nail files. Oh man. Oh, it comes out nice. Oh, I'm telling I you. I hit all the sides, they're coming out nice and round. Yeah, so when you pick up that concourse winning Corsair, you put a nice fingernail print in it. Yeah, yeah. Now we really did have a great day at the field, but we get home and I have the little things set aside like fixing these Allen wrenches. What happens if you just go and grind this with a turn a cherry red, you lose the temper in the steel and then it strips out worse and worse each time. So the whole trick here is take a little bit, put it in a little can or a jar of water. a very little bit at a time. That's a tip that can save you a lot of money buying new Allen wrenches. And when they're all done like this, you have not detempered the steel. That's the main thing. Remember the old tongue muffler? What I did, this has 10 093 holes. Verify it with a caliper. What I want to do, I want to find a drill. I have a drill that's eighth inch, which is 125. And I know that'll be real close for my needs. Now, don't remember, this may suit your needs to have, this would be a real quiet muffler, but in this case, we're trying to pull a relatively big, thick winged airplane. So what I'm gonna do is take and drill all of these holes out to 120, and then clean this all up and get it ready for another day of testing. You know, one thought you could do here, if you wanted to have a pressure fitting, we've been running pressure on sometimes, no pressure other times. But one of the things you could do is decide at this point in time where you want to have that pressure fitting, where it would be convenient. We haven't done that yet because we're just basically doing some rough testing. But, but having these holes opened up, they're going to be opened up to 120 right now. I think what it's going to do, it's going to allow the engine to unload just a little bit more. It'll allow me to turn a little bit bigger prop too. But again, if, if I drill the holes too big, then I'll drill and tap them for 632 screws and just plug the holes up with screws. Now at the end of the session, one of the things I was going to try, I'm going to try it on the next session, is starting to plug up some of those extra holes with 632 screws so that in effect I can have a variable, a variable back pressure muffler. Now another tip. Another thing, real important, I've seen a lot of guys do this. They go home and bolt this on an engine. Then they put it in a car for a while. Well, the chips will, all of this winds up in the engine. What you really want to do is flush this with water, lacquer thinners, anything. Get in there with Q-tips. And this will be ready for another day of testing. And it'll, an interesting thing is the, the Bill Mazzoni muffler with 20 holes, it's got 20 holes. It seems to be a little on the, the, the less less back pressure than we need. This one seemed a little more back pressure. So I'm thinking this is 10, the other one is 20. We'll probably wind up with 15 of these holes and hey, if we don't, we can always fill a couple of them with threads. Another thing I like to do, you see I have, I don't know if anybody has these, you can buy them in machine shops, and it has a drill or you can use a countersink, but I always like to break the edge of the hole. What happens if you don't do that? When you go to wipe the airplane off, Needless to say, you always wind up hooking a paper towel on it or something that makes it a little inconvenient. Once I get all the metal work done, I'll go over to the sink, flush this out, make sure I don't have any residue, any aluminum chips. That just adds a nice little, it's nice and smooth now.
and that's a step you really don't want to leave out. You go get aluminum chips into the into the motor, especially if you spend all this time getting the motor to run right. Now what I'm trying to do is just clean this part up. A sandblast finish is real good for a lot of reasons. It dissipates heat, and you don't get to see the tooling marks. But in this case, I want to see if this is going to polish up. Any good quality aluminum would polish up relatively quickly. Piece of 600 sandpaper. Usually some of that Brillo with the soap in it. Give an idea just how long this is gonna. Yeah, I just like the look of having polished parts on a plane instead of. Actually, we could get this. See, you can't anodize it because these screws are in it. You'd have to take it apart. I don't want to take it apart right now. But anyway, it gives us another trim option. This this is a little bit heavier than the tongue, so what I have the choice of now, I could run the tongue with nose weight, tongue with no nose weight, this with nose weight, this without nose weight. I can come up with a lot of trim combinations, because this puts the weight further down toward the bottom of the airplane, and that definitely, definitely is the way we want to go with the weight. What happens, you don't see this when a, when a finish is sand cast, you don't see tooling marks. So when you do the sanding now, you find you see a tooling mark here or there. It's, it's not objectionable, but you want to take some five or six hundred sandpaper and get rid of that tooling mark before you do the polishing. Otherwise, you're going to just be redundant in spending all that time polishing it. It was amazing that down at the field, there was like six, seven other people there today, and everybody saw this muffler and they were, oh, oh, nuclear science, rocket science. No. I guess these are new, not many people have seen them before. Kind of cool. Now it always gives you a really, a quick aluminum finish. Even if you don't do the buffing, the polishing. Good old SOS with soap in it. Doesn't take long and you have an awful lot of the scratches come right out. Now I want to try on this. Get some wax on the wheel. Again, to a lot of people, these kind of things wouldn't matter, and it's not appropriate to do these in a production. You'd have to charge a hundred dollars for the muffler, and then nobody'd want to buy it. But you certainly can. One of the cheapest tools you can buy is just an ordinary motor. Put a buffing wheel on it, and do your own buffing. Just labor. That's all it is. Another nice benefit of this kind of a muffler, you have a little bit more of a chamber volume in here, which has to be an advantage. It also acts like a big heat sink right at the exhaust where you need it the most. The most here, look at that. That shined up nice. It's a nice piece of aluminum. Hey, you spend five or ten minutes, you know, and, and you really, at the end, you have something that's a little bit nicer than a stock part. Now, whenever we get a big wood order, you now we got a kind of a big wood order from Sig here. What I do is put the wood together for the kits appropriately. Kenny usually goes through it, takes out all the sea grain, so that we're using sea grain for flaps. And when he makes up prowler kits, you want to use sea grain. We've gotten how many pieces out of this load already? Uh, it looks like uh, well, six. Oh, we've got enough, yeah. And well, I want to make 25 kits, so I want to make sure we have 50 pieces of sea grain. And there's only a couple of pieces that are sea. Yeah. I really see. Yeah, now see, anybody that doesn't know, this is a real piece of sea grain. This is really nice. So, Also, we go through, even though this is contest graded wood and we're paying the price of contest graded wood, once in a while you get pieces that are not, and we separate them out. Of course, they never wind up going into the kits. And what you can do with this is you can make a go no go gauge. You can set the gauge for what the weight is for a piece of quarter inch that's six pounds. Anyone that, that buries the scale, you can just basically sell to somebody who's not building a competition oriented. See, a wind check piece here. That's yeah. You don't have that much sea grain in that part. Mm -hmm. There's one. There's one. It's part. This is part sea grain. It looks like it's a yeah. little. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me show this. Right oh, let me get the here. phone. You can use these that are even half because you can make the flap on the part that's sea grain. You get the phone. 
Now when I cut out the cowlings, you can see here's a piece we dedicated for cowlings right here. How they all lay out. Once they're all cut out, sanded, they're ready to carve. Or of course if you want to go for the option, you can go for the fiberglass option. This batch of wood came out with some nice, some nice one inch pieces. I used the harder ones for wheel pants, the softer ones for inboard wingtips. And of course that stuff, when you have a whole pile of wingtips, you want to put the lighter ones on the inboard tip so you can maximize the use of the good wood. And not many things in the world are better than laser cut parts. Ooh, boy they look so nice. And do they fit. How you doing with that? You getting any good stuff out of this batch? I just found... Usually you get one or two pieces that are really super. Well, we'll have to see, actually. Now this is really time consuming, but you can tell if, if you want to put together real good quality kits, you really do need sea grain wood for flaps. You're, if it flaps, rudders, elevators, whatever. You really just can't take the pick of the litter. And this is the little things that I feel make a cardinal kit worth the time and energy to build it as you start off having all the wood the right weight and the right kind of wood. So what I'm doing is taking a prop that worked real well today, the 13-4, making another one up and taking a little bit of a pitch out to see if I can get it to run just a little bit slower. See what I'm doing? I'm getting to de-pitch the prop. You take the bottom of the trailing edge, the top of the leading edge. The up pitch, you take the front, do the reverse, and the back. So if I want a down pitch, I take the top and kill a little bit of that, and the back, and that'll lower the pitch about a quarter of a pitch. This one all pitched up, de-pitched I should say. And what this should do is act as a, a little bit of a lower gear. And again, we'll find out. We're going to be doing a lot of carving and sanding all through the summer till we get this finalized. Also, John sent me, uh, what is this, a Bali? Can't even tell. A 12.5. Anyway, this is exactly the opposite technology. This is high RPM technology and what I have here is basically low off. Uh, this one's close. But boy, the one thing you want to do with these props, if you do nothing else. Boy, oh boy, they are, that is, you could shave with these props. Boy, don't ever flip one of these by hand. Anyway, we'll give these all a test next time we get down a field. Actually, these come pretty well balanced. That's I'm amazed. Okay, out of today's little work session, we got three new props to try. We got a 13-4 cut to 11 and a half and with the pitch taken out of it, so it's really an under pitch prop. We got a BYNO 12-4, which looks like it's on a low pitch side. And this Bali, whatever it really is, it's got two dimensions written on it. One side says 12.5 and the other one says 11 and a half, four and a half, five and a half. Well, we'll give them all a try. That's the only way you really know. Between 44.3 and 30 grams. A range roughly of 50%. Right. <laughs> And uh, over here on this stuff that either looked good or is actually sea grain. Okay, this is flap wood. Yeah, there's a range of, of 39, essentially. 39 to 28. To 28. All right. So.
Actually, this was a pretty good batch of wood. There was no garbage in it at all. Uh -huh. Now, I think this sheeting's going to work out. How many got 75 sheets to weigh? It looks like at least. Yeah, boy. Well, um. anyway, that's the way we grade the wood, and that's, that's basically now going to go into the next production run of Cardinal Kits. most people attempted to do is run away. Oh, we got piece 30 grams. Oh, it's the lightest piece. But a lot of times when you take the lightest piece, certainly not always, the lightest piece isn't always the one you want to make a flap or something structural out of. So what, in your case, let's get flap wood first. Let's see what the first, this is the, this is the pile we want to work with? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty straight. So you would want, what do you want to take, 10 of these? Yeah. Um, okay, what Ken's going to do... And some of them are heavy, but you but look at them straight. and you've got to take them. Uh, right. Now, another thing, too, because Ken's going to be using some of these for leading and trailing edges on foam wings as well as kits. We want the, the ones that are as straight as can be. When you make a trailing edge or a leading edge on a foam wing, you usually strip off a piece, and then if it goes... You're I mean, stuck. Like this one. This one's heavy, but I might not want to leave that in place. I don't know. When I make... I like it. See grain See, if this possible. One, this one's dead straight. Okay, we'll go through them. Because so. when you're just using them for cosmetic stuff, it, it doesn't really matter. But when you're making structural parts, this is kind of important. Now I can remember, in the, in the very near future, Ken and I are going to try to come up with some kind of a gizmo jig fixture for joining sheeting. We'll obviously put it on video. One of the biggest mistakes you can make in anything in life is you're building a model. There's certain parts of a model, fuse sides for one, flaps, rudder, and you're always tempted to grab that real light piece of A-grain wood and use it, and somewhere down the road it comes back to get you. Wood selection is such an important thing. It really does pay. We spent the, be the better part of a whole afternoon here just grading out, and we don't even have it. We haven't even done the 16th yet. But if you're trying to use 16th wood for foam wings and it looks like a washboard already and the joints are there's no way by the time you're done filling that it's heavier than if you use 10 pound wood now this is this is probably one of the most heartwarming letters i've ever received this is from larry ladd of course if you've been watching all the tapes you know this is his grandson nathan and nathan he says it was a beautiful letter Nathan goes on and on about how many other interests he has. Now check this out. This you would expect. These are the kind of things you expect. You know, in the modern world, and hey, you know, let's be honest, if we were all growing up in this day and age, maybe we'd all be doing this. He has gas powered dune buggies, gas powered cars. That's not unusual. But let me show you what is unusual. He entered a contest, and I'm trying to I don't I don't want to shortchange him here. He has many interests, many other interests in school. Kite building is one of them. Well, I guess, Nathan, if you only knew, Dave Midgley is a champion kite builder. He went all the way to Hawaii just to enter a kite contest. Out on Hawaii, he makes and sells kites, too. Another picture of Nathan. And what I like about this is you get to see the other side of people beside the modeling world, beside the triple-engine German bomber side of Nathan. But anyway, check some of this out. Now, there's some... I don't know, I guess I have a soft side for grandchildren. He had a, there was a contest, and I don't want to, I don't want to shortchange him here. I, it's a pretty long letter, I don't want to get in here. Anyway, he competed in a bridge building contest sponsored by the Professional Engineers Society and came in seventh overall out of 225 engineers. Now check this bridge out. Now I'm just thinking, hey, Nathan, let me, let me give you a clue. I'm going to build a garden railroad next summer. The length of the bridge is 15 feet, and it's got to hold up LGB trains. Now, look, what I want you to do, Nathan, is very carefully go out and order some womanized wood and make me a 16-foot, 9-inch bridge for my train set. Bet it'll do it, too. Anyway, and most of all, we want to see some pictures of that triple-engine German bomber fighter. Larry, you can be proud. He's a good boy, I'll tell you. Hey, when I was young, I didn't even have a drill. I didn't even have a drill. I used to take an ice pick and stick it through the pulse of it. And you know what was funny? Looking at this picture, I mean, yeah, obviously he has a beautiful shop. One of the things I remember when I was this age, 
I'll bet everybody is. You could never cut eighth-inch plywood. I used to have a big saw with the big teeth like you'd use in a, a lumberjack would use, and I'd chew it all up, and, oh, God, what a mess. Anyway, Nathan, thanks a lot for the photos. And be glad that you don't have to cut wood like I did. And another thing came in the mail. I got a collection of books here. I have to tell you, this is from Brian McCarthy. He's been sharing books with me, and I've been sharing videos with him. And I'm telling you, this is getting to be... I have a library here. What I did run over... These, some of these books are just unbelievably good. Fighter planes. i got to show you some of the old... One of the ones I really like. He's been sharing a lot of cool stuff. And... You know, when you can make a friend that has many interests in common, an example is Dave Midgley and I both enjoy fish, uh, various other things like that, people that enjoy motorcycles or fighter planes or semi scale then you've really got the basis of a good relationship. And this is one I particularly like. I'm not crazy about the cover. Look at the cover. Hey, what's this? Spitfires are supposed to shoot Messerschmitts down. Who, who sent this book out here? Anyway, just let me run through these real quick. There's some real interesting photos in here. Look at this picture of the British Typhoon. Oh, man. Talk about a nice side view for a stunt model. Check that out. Really nicely detailed book. These are great, Brian. Now talk about a nice profile for a stunt ship. Look at this. Now look at the top one on skis. Now that's something Banjack would do. Now look for that nose on the uh, the eye beamer. Oh man, look at these Spitfires down here. These are great books. This is. I was sitting out by the pond yesterday. In fact. These books came yesterday from UPS. I knew exactly what it was. I ripped them out. I went out, sat by the pond, had a double cup of coffee, and basically wasted half of the afternoon reading. Not wasted. I really enjoyed it. Some great photos. Really nice photos. Speaking of things you have in common, I had, this is going back a ways, I had some calls from Gary Tultz from Ohio, and he was doing up a hurricane, a semi-scale hurricane, and we exchanged a bunch of stuff, videos and movies and whatever. <laughs> it's amazing when you have more than one thing in common with a person, you almost get to be their intimate friend instantly. It's not like when you, you know, you only like flying and then, you know, one person goes his way, you go your way. When you can share more than one thing, wow. And as I said before, Brian and I used to both own boats in the early 70s on the same lake in New Jersey, and now he's in Colorado Springs, and I'm here in Rutherford, and he got rich and I didn't. It's as simple as that. To me, the key to happiness is, or one of the things, is just having an interest in the whole world around you, not focusing in on one little tiny ant hill or one little tiny uh, pile of dirt. But the whole world around you is full of interesting things. As I said before, I don't like this picture. It's, whoever did this picture, reverse it. I uh, hear one Spitfire is getting away up here. I want to tell you a real short, funny story. I was down at Ski Dombrowski's house with Joe Ortiz years ago, and he has a picture on his wall of very similar to this scene. World War I planes, and, and it's so detailed. It's, it's probably 8 feet by about 12 feet. I don't know. It's gigantic hand-painted oil painting he made. It's in his home. And it's so detailed, you can see that what color ties the pilots are wearing, what color scarfs they have. A quick funny story. I don't know if you've seen on TV the, the commercial for a... Uh, it's a deck finish, and there's a guy pretending he's the Red Baron flying like a half-A 
Fokker triplane. They approached me to make that model, and I turned them down. I said, oh, gee, I'm not a scale modeler. I wonder who really got the contract to do it. It's kind of a cool, it's kind of a cool commercial. The guy's flying control line on his deck. Now, I know George Ventrini, being a professional artist, can do things like this picture, but... And he just finished a picture of the 614, the steam engine, an oil painting. I wish you would... George, try giving it to me. Anyway, he's going to do some aerial things, too. He's got some GB pictures he's working on. And every time I see one, I'm convinced my next Spitfire will have one of these tiger mouth deals. I never realized they did these on all different planes. There's there's Messerschmitts with these Tiger Mouth. This must have been like a famous thing in World War II. Little information I'm uncovering here. Kind of cool. And the exhaust. We will have molded exhaust on that new plane, too. Tell me that wouldn't make you think about it if you saw this coming at you at 400 miles an hour. And the problem with... I guess the problem with all of us, Joe Adamusco, myself also, is you run out of time. You have all these... Now, P-40 has always been one of my favorite planes. What a great semi-scale stunt ship. But you run out of life. There's only so many hours you have, so many months, and the trouble is we're all old and we're all getting older and we're closer to the end than we are to the beginning. If only I had these same dreams and abilities when I was younger. That mouth, I love that. That's funny, I remember how excited Bandrock was when he went for that steaming ride out in Muncie. Hey, it is an exciting thing. Never pass up a chance. Even if you have to not eat lunch for a month, it's worth it. All that oil and smoke and vibration, and you'll never forget it. Here's a very rare picture of Dan Banjock's first stunt ship flying over the George Washington Bridge in Philadelphia, Missouri. Look at this. Can you imagine what that feels like? Some really unusual fighter paint jobs here. Now that would make an excellent stunt ship. That would probably, somebody's already done it. Give you an idea of some of the details in this book. This is just, I mean, I don't know how other people are, but I could just sit for hours and look at it and see little things that I never saw the first time around. Here's one of the coolest planes. If you, if you, Nathan, if you want to do something unusual, counter rotating props. Look at this. Not even not even counter rotating. It's just a six blade pusher prop. Wow. Little dolly wheels on the rudders. So many details on these things. So many ideas. Now, when John Brodak was looking for Fock Wolf detailing, I wish I had this book. There's, there's just page after page of Fock Wolf stuff. All different paint jobs, all different ideas for trim schemes, the development, the whole series of Fock Wolves. Oh, there's something out of Musco and I both like the old Spitfire cockpit. Wonderful book, Brian. I really have to tell a whole series of books. Every one of them is great. All the variations, all the side views, good source of information. I think Joe at one time even had some some kind of side view drawings for this as a stunt ship. Boy.
Well, we mailed out Steve DeGiulia's uh, plans to his moosey. He's got two sets of plans. I hope he's making two mosquitoes. Maybe he can get Palco to make one. Let me tell you, Steve, I better get some construction photos. That's a beautiful plane. And, but we're obviously just waiting for Aronstein to finish his and come on down to paint it. Retracts and all. Awesome. You know, one of the reasons a lot of people don't appreciate semi-scale stuff is they just don't have any books. They have no videos. They have no magazines. They have no way of even knowing about some of this stuff. And the artwork, the paintings in these books are just spectacular, just unbelievable. Imagine in World War I, imagine some of the, the real-life scenes that must have really happened similar to this. Mm, bear cats. Mm, whole section on bear cats. And we know this makes a great stunt model. Either profile or built up a great stunt model. Great profile, too, for pilot's view. I think it was Jim Vornholt that flew, or was it Jack Sheeks? Not sure. One of the guys from Indianapolis had an ME 262 semi scale stunner. Yeah, that'd be a nice pilot's view. Banjock, check this out. I mean, come on. Putting all these on just to torment Dan Bandrock. Oh man, Dan, come on, finish that canopy mold. Hard not to like that, huh, Dan? You could probably win about 10 circle burner contests in a row if you paint your plane just like this. Who could deny how awesome Paul Walker's B-17 is? Oh, man, am I glad we have flights of that on video for all time. That will be captured. Now, imagine if we didn't have video of that. Hmm. Something happens, accident in a plane, and, and nobody ever gets to see it. It's like a piece of artwork that you lock in a cellar. You know, and even if you have no real interest in semi-scale stunt ships, have any ideas, you can always apply these to cardinals and noblers and impacts and everything. And I talk about a beautiful picture, imagine having that nice, nice big oil painting of that hanging in your shop. Yeah, there's a whole world out there just waiting to be discovered. Okay, DeJulia, Aronstein, the whole section on mosquitoes here. I try to get you all the ideas I can. I know both of you guys are watching these videos, coming up with ideas. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Now that's the kind of picture we like to see. There you go. Whoever artworked this up, there's the picture right there. Look at this in a dive. Oh my god. I wish I was younger.
it is the artwork we love. Ryan, you're going to keep me busy for a month here reading these things. Oh, the canopy coming off of the zero. That's on a Mustang too, imagine. Banjack, don't forget, Mustangs can have tiger mouths too. What books? Brian, thanks a million. Appreciate it a lot. Circle barn, but I hope it's going to be some good prop testing. I'm just giving Mike a break. The motor grass and the dandelions. We already wound up testing about four or five of the props, but the grass must be mowed. This guy does a hell of a job. I don't get what Peabody says about him. So we're just taking a break. We'll run down and get some coffee here, and uh, might have Mike play guard dog to the equipment. Now we're early this morning when the air was real cool. This is the volley that John sent. That was working a little pretty good, 11 and a half, 5 and a half. It's just a little too racy right now. Maybe in some real hot air that'll be a fine choice. I went through the 12-4 the is a little on the wimpy side, the 12-4 BYNO. And still the best one, and this is why I love to verify it, is the 13-4 cut down to about 11 and a quarter. Now I made a couple made at 11 and a half just to see, but even at 11 and a four, you can see those, those tips are really wide. I've got them all dressed off. I made some with a little more pitch, some with a little less pitch. And this is, the, this is where it gets to be fine tuning now. We're pretty well closing in on having something that there aren't many props left to test, but by doing all this testing, I hope it's gonna save somebody all of the pain in the neck of doing it on their own. And you may as well just leave the props and wrenches right out on it if you're going to change your prop of flight here. Now what I do, once I test the prop and I know for sure the load is right, I'll write either good, high, or low. Make any notations I want. This prop we tested at the circle burner field. And this now, after, after many flights really, after a couple of days even, is still proven to be the best of the props we have. It's 11 and a quarter. It's a 13-4 cut down to 11 and a quarter. Real wide prop load. And this one really seems to be the one that seems to work at least at the circle burner field on the 65 foot lines. Another little thing of interest because this prop is about twice as heavy as the wood props. With this prop on I needed to adjust the tab just a little bit to get the vertical CG right. Also, I took a couple of flights with nothing but an aluminum washer between the prop and with a half ounce of nose weight. And it really likes the aluminum washer a lot better than a nose weight. The wood props, you can see it's not even on a plane. The wood props like to have a, a half ounce of nose weight. So we're real close to having these moment arms working just about the way they should. I can do once I get these props and I'm real happy with this one of the things I want to do of course is paint them just to dress them off 
But I've got two or three, not 11 and a half. You can see what's happened here. It's become 11 and a quarter right at the field. <laughs> I made up a spare 11 and a quarter. This is a while back. These props, all of these, the Rich Peabody swears he's getting all kind of good motor runs and everything with these. And I just don't get the kind of line tension with these that I'm real comfortable with, but I'm going to save them. The 10 6, of course, is still a prop that went way too fast. And the BYNOs, we can't get anymore, so, except for the few that we have. And this one belongs to Doug Benedetti. I don't want to chew that one up. So, we're working up, and it's, it's just nothing from this point on but taking a flight change of prop. It looks like we're going to get a, quite a few flights today, but uh, every time you can add to your knowledge. And you'll notice another thing with a little bit of nose weight, the plane really lays in on the bottoms. With the nose weight out, it really has a radical corner, so you can fine tune it to whatever flying style you know, you're really happy with. I have a feeling this plane is going to ultimately have a real broad range of trim. Now is the one thing left I want to go back to the original prop that I started the day with. And make sure it's always a good thing to check. Sometimes you fool yourself or the air gets better. It's gotten a little hotter. Give Mike a scare.
even though the air is really shifty and moving around. This prop seems to be working pretty good today. I've gotten a, because I've been here for a, a lot of hours, with an interruption, I've gotten to try this in the cool morning air and in the warm air. We got Mike working over here. Mike, you're okay. Clean this field up. <laughs> he does a great job, by the way. Well, there's nothing better than the end of a session when you know you've gotten something accomplished. A little more data into the bank. The next time we have some free time down the shop, all the props that were working well, we can get some paint on them so that the oil doesn't soak into them. Always a nice way to end the day at the circle down the field. That's convenient. This is so close. I find that even if, even when I'm not in the mood to come up here, I wind up coming up here. Nice waterfall. Anyway, we are getting ready to buy our first, our first trunk load of plants here. Karen's out shopping for plants. We painted up all the props we wound up using the other day. Just never get sick of this. Next summer, guys. Bill Mazzoni just blew up the engine in his race car, so I got a note from him with tears all over it. Oh, God. Bill, instead of building another race car, you and I go partners on a nice garden railroad. This is really some nice setup. Very relaxing. All right, give me the full history. I even forgot. That's how bad this is. My memory shot. This was started. It still looks like it's in nice shape, though. I tell you, take nice care of the stuff. This was started 90. This was a 94 job. So you know how much fun I've been doing. <laughs> yeah, you wore it right out, huh? Amazing. You only get half a season. So we're going to take the the, six, the OS 60 out. I guess the OS 60, and put it in a Super Tiger 60. What we're going to do is retrofit this plane to a non-tuned pipe plane, which uh, many people have done, needless to say. Russ has his traditional <laughs> cat cat technology here. Poor Becky. What'd you add? About four ounces in Letraset to this guy? Wow. About, about four Not, ounces. And about yeah. Four. Hey, it looks good. This still looks good. It's amazing. Yeah. Planes really do hold up well. Yeah. Oberhurst der Frugermeyer <laughs> has the her, nice scoop up on the top. Keep your hands off this is right there. Keep your keep your hands off my baby. Okay, this is a Rod Stewart approved plane. Let's get that uh, pad and flip it upside down and see what we got here. Okay. All right, this has the no cal nose. I got to remember one. This has been a long time ago. Yeah, why don't you start wearing some stuff out? <laughs> By the way, now that Ken's got that foam wing shop going, yep. maybe for lunch we'll go over there and check out his foam wing. Okay. You want to see the stuff he's doing over there, baby. Oh, my God. He's got foam you can't even breathe over there. Last time I was here, he was just thinking about doing it. Yeah, no, no. It's, he's rocking. He's shipping wings out every day now. I'll be damned. Yeah, he's been doing some good work. This has the old Rabe. Uh, Rabe yeah, still got the Rabe rudder on there. All right. Pretty cool. Oh, well, wipe it off. We don't want to work on some oil-soaked piece of junk here. <laughs> right. All right, first thing we got to do is get those landing gear off, and let's let's take a look at that nose. We need to uh, this guy here. And one of the things, whenever you go from making a uh, a tune pipe plane to a no tune pipe plane, 
there's always some little tricky things down in the nose there, and we may have to grind that out. I forget if the VMAX was wider or thinner. I don't even remember. No. But I got a test engine, and we got your good engine to put in there, yep. too. We could put the good one in. This way you can't accuse me of stealing your good engine later. <laughs> yeah, they're scarce. Yeah, leave the screws in there. They're scarce. That tank still looks good. I got to tell you, it still looks like a good plane. Well, you, you test hopped it one time. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it flies good. You don't have to. One thing Russ does that I like, and I, I don't know if he picked this up from me or I picked it up from him. He's got all his stuff in plastic bags, spinners, spinner nuts, which plane they go on, you know, how much money he owes Wendy for supper. Well, that's over here. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. I left that one home. <laughs> got his props all ready. Look at this guy. Hard to get. Got your three blades ready. Okay. Yeah, we could repitch these up for 60s. That's okay. no problem. What else has he got? Boys, all kind of tricky spinners. We got more spinners than I do here. Fantastic yeah. tongue mufflers. Carl everything. Seifert. Carl mufflers. Okay. The side guy comes down the side of the plane. I don't know. What right. Oh, of course. Well, yeah. Let's see. We hey, got it. that's a nice. See what's nice about this. When we did this no cowling thing, what's nice about this was made for V Max. Big Jim was reworking V Maxes. This was one of his. And I don't remember, but I know the holes can line up, not line up. So what we may want to do is not use your really super good engine. If we have to drill the engine, okay. we want to drill up one that ain't, you know, the, the pride of the litter here. Yeah, that looks like we're going to have to do some drilling and carving. Also, you, we're going to have to probably do a lot of dremeling in here to get that that 60 to fit nice and tight. But when you make a plane with the aluminum mounts, it gives you that option. If you don't have that aluminum and all you have is that thin wood in there, oh. We'll say this. Big Jim job. This is a good one. That is a brand new one. Which one you just get for me? Oh no, no, don't. We don't want to butcher that one. Let's butcher up one of my old motors. The one you got here. I got old motors. You can that have holes already butchered up, so you can use that motor until you know until you burn it up. Oh, the one we have, we we'll, we'll bugger that one up. But we don't have one buggered up. See the one I use. See what I always do. I always keep one engine. This one always says here. This is for making crutches because it it hasn't got the holes opened up. But I don't want to. I don't want to take one like this. I'll take one from the box. It already has the holes opened up, and see if we can get it to fit. Okay. I mean, we could always switch the guts from one motor to another if it's if it's got a lot of time on. It's no problem. All right. So the first thing is let's get out the old motor. This ought to be real easy. Get out the Dremel tool. So what I did, I took some WD-40 on one of the motor mount bolts since this plane has had a motor in it for years. One of these bolts is bad, and we don't really remember which one. I think it was a, yeah this one. This is the one that's. Grooved up, so we're gonna have to live with. Yeah. Okay. I want to block up this tank, but anytime you're doing this kind of work, boy, you want to get so nothing. Yeah, if you got a forceps, that'd help. This is this is the official John Pothier Sizzles. Hello, you haven't used me in years. Oh, oh I wanted to do this for so long. That's for, for, uh, yeah, for these are these are real handy. They're vasectomy. real handy. Yeah, for doing airplane vasectomies. <laughs> I just don't want to get a bunch of goobers in there. Okay. Now, whenever you have a bolt that's broken off below the motor mount, obviously one of the things we could do is, and we may still have to do it, is cut a notch here. We could all, first choice would be you go with three bolts. Not a good choice. What I did is I, the bolt is broken off down below there, and I can't remember. It was years ago. I don't remember how we broke it or why we broke it or why we didn't fix it then. Probably because we were just too lazy. But what I tried to do is I tried to heat this with a Dremel tool, just get down there and open up the wood just a little bit, and I threaded down a piece of aluminum down into the, and let it catch on the edge because the aluminum threads real easy. Thread it over the part of the bolt that's now down broken in there. What I'm going to do is cut this off and drop a few drops of hot stuff down in there. Let it kick and then see if I can back thread this out. I, and I'm not so sure this is going to work. But one of the things I always do is put the mistakes on as well. Not a mistake. This is something that's probably worth trying. But I really do like to have four bolts in this if we could. All right, just let, let's cut this off for us. And then we could drop some CA down through that tube. And I'm hoping, boy, I'm hoping this is going to work. Yep, just cut it off. Then open that up with a little knife. And we'll drop a couple drops of CA down in there. 
Anyway, when you get to this point in time, it's always, you're at desperate measures for desperate men. And if this doesn't work, we really didn't lose anything. You don't scooch up the paint, my boy. Come on, Russ. Yeah, yeah, pinch it. That's all. I thought I thought you were doing. Now drop a couple drops of thin CA right down there real carefully. Don't drop it on the paint. Where's your CA department? Yeah. See Careful. That. Put it in there real carefully. Okay. All right, now try to get some kicker down in there. This ought to be fun. <laughs> no, don't. No, no, no. Get it down inside the tube. Uh, okay, what do we got there? Just, just don't get it on the paint if you can help it. Desperate measures. Yeah, put that around there. You got it. All right. I'm telling you, this guy knows how to mess up his paint job. <laughs> Midgley would be proud. Okay. And get some kicker down on that. If, if this works, we write about it for stunt news. If it doesn't work, we'll blame you. We'll try to say you bolt. You broke the bolt. Actually, the truth is I broke the bolt. Okay. Let's let that kick, and then we'll try to back that out. If it doesn't work, you got a three-bolt engine. <laughs> well, run. Now, that's funny. Years ago, we were all taking 60 ships and converting them to tune pipes, and now what I see more of is people doing this and converting them back to 60s. So, strange world we live in. What happened, it just broke the tubing. The tubing wasn't hard enough, so now we're, we're stuck with another dilemma. We can always file that down, but we still want to give this one more try. I still want to try to get some way of grabbing that if I can. What I did, I tried to grind, I tried to, since the, the tubing broke off. By the way, a better idea would have been to do this with copper, I think, and thread the copper ahead of time. Of course, now that the job is done, we think it is. I put some, try to carve like a slot in there with a pointed Dremel tool. I want to see if I can make a screwdriver that I'll get in there and get that out now. Well, as you can probably surmise, we have given up. That screw, <laughs> that screw is definitely, the only way we're going to get it out is with a jackhammer. But what we're going to do is put it together with three screws, and then one of the other options is to get safety wire bolts, bolts that have a hole drilled in the head that you can put a safety wire through them. That's one of the choices. But first, we're going to try doing it this way. And I have run engines with three bolts before in an emergency, and you just, at the end of a flying day, you need to tighten. Luckily, it's on the side of the engine, where if it, if it was under the muffler, then you'd have to take the muffler off to tighten it up. This is very convenient in the fact that you can just move the fuel filter to the side and get in there. You can do it whenever you want. Now the next thing is that we got to do some grinding and cutting to get the motor to fit, because these motors are just a little bit bigger than the V-Maxes. So, but before we do that, the most important thing is to have a nice big cup of coffee. There's going to be a lot of... We've, we've just totally given up on the idea of getting that bolt. I hate to surrender, Russ, but it, it's time. We had to do it. All right, what we're going to do, before we do this, anytime you do any Dremel tooling on a motor, what we're trying to do is we took a motor that already has the holes enlarged, and we have to go... A little bit in on both sides to get the holes to line up and this before now of course the motor has to be in place before I cut the exhaust hole number one and we're trying not to use up a motor that has virgin holes in it of course that's number two and the third thing of course is we want to get this in plug, plug them up make sure just just stuff that down in and make sure there's no way while we're doing a Dremel and you can get any chips in that motor that's that's, that's an absolute important thing to get that packet right in good Kind of tough on compression, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Look at Russ's whole head through these holes now. <laughs> now, obviously, anytime you do this, you need to make some real solid fender washers for on top. Okay. The key is not, is not to take any more than you have to. And what we've done is go back and forth. Fit this in here, Russ. Okay. I want to look at it from the top. Is only take the minimum amount. Just take a hammer and hit it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, I got to get the phone. Okay, now see what Russ has. This is a real good way to do it. Take that tab out. He put these, did we put dowels in the wood or did you just glue these right yeah, into the wood? They just kind of drilled them and just uh, zapped them in. It's, okay. not, it's not the way you do it, but... Uh, no, 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 it's good. Joe Adamusco had a nice way. He just inset some dowels, which I never thought. I've seen thought. better yet. And now this, of course, is your trim tab. When we go to fly this, which we hope is going to be... See, you got to get the holes lined up. Yeah. Oh, they do line up. Yeah, they're good. Okay, now what I would want to do is if you take this, this is like 20,000 aluminum. Yeah. 
let's before you leave make up one a little bit bigger and one even so that on the first day of trimming we, with the holes in the right spot I got some. we don't have to go chasing our tail trying to figure out you know find a soda can out at Middlesex or something okay. they'll be all set and ready to go when we're ready all right the motor fit right in I think it's perfect what we have to do is grind a little bit away here because on a side exhaust engine I need to be able to get the rod in and tighten up the bolts on this side so we're going to make a little relief here with the Dremel tool of course, the next thing, we're going to seal this nice and tight with some thin CA, and that'll allow us to get down in there with a the no-cal nose. Okay, we should be able to get in. Now we got to line up. i got to make a little mark in there to cut the hole for the exhaust. That's what I want. And I'm sure the needle valve isn't going to line up either. That's another beautiful little... These things were always just a little bit off when we did them. What we cut the hole, what I did, I just tried to do this by eye, is line up the exhaust port and line up the paint line just estimate that down here because I want to line this up now I want to look right from the top and get myself a gauge on where this would be front to back and then cut right in the middle and then enlarge it out once I can see in there enlarge it out just a little bit at a time with a small Dremel tool Okay, that gives us a rough idea where that little set, where that little hole is going to be. Now, just carefully take that tape off for us, real carefully, and then we'll dress that off. Get some thin CA on there. Take the pan, take it off real slow, so you don't. Uh, you want to seal that with that whole edge with some thin CA, and then dress it right off. Now we made this big enough so that no matter what, we can use this this down as a call Seifert muffler, or a tongue muffler, or a windy tongue muffler, or whatever you want to use. Always make the hole big enough. That's kind of a cool muffler. I never saw one of these. I have a feel. Our picture of the tongue in there too. Now what I did to line up the holes to tighten the muffler piece of 16th wire, put a point on, and just shove it through. And this gives me a good alignment for the holes. Or it could be a long needle valve, couldn't it? Wendy? Yeah, this could be a nice long tiger needle valve. <laughs> <laughs> Rear needle valve, goober. Now a good tip when doing this is run it on a grindstone until it's good and hot. That gives you a nice point to work with. And now we'll take a Dremel tool with a, a little draft angle and just pop them through and then put the little brass rivets in there, little brass eyelets. We need, shape, huh? we need to go, no, we need to go up in this direction. Yeah. What I'll do is get one of those circle plotters and plot it with a circle plotter. Okay. I can use any of the circle plotters just to get that to line right through the center the needle valve. You can see what I'm going to have to do is take a little bit of material off of one side. Yeah. And I like to work in this dimension, just lay one end on the table. It's the easiest way to do it. Yeah, it's getting well. We're going to paint this afternoon. Okay, that's about as neat as you're going to get those screws. All right, now we're going to take it out and finish these edges with black epoxy. Okay. Oh, all these little edges, we want to dress them all off, sand them real nice. We have all the alignment holes. We have these ready to go. And what I want to do is I want to mix up some epoxy with some black dye and just paint a coat of that in there. It's all sealed with thin CA. And we can put the whole nose section together and do a little test run on the motor, make sure we don't have any... I don't know what could be in that tank by now. Get some black dye, some five-minute epoxy and mix up what I hope will be a nice fuel proof coating for all the new holes that we've put in the plane and we'll get down in here a little bit anything that still needs to be fuel proofed uh, if, if now trick one is wing, we're getting rid of all of this ripped. old tubing this is garbage yeah. replacing it with this brand and this is the only brand I really like to use this is the good stuff make up all new tubing since we've got a plane that's four or five years sitting around Get all new tubing on it. Very cheap insurance. Okay. 
Now after that whole modification, it is now an official 60 ship. What we want to do, of course, is get some some runs on it to see if there's anything still in the tank. Of course, that three bolt thing is going to change. As soon as the next time he gets a visit, we'll replace that blind nut. But for now, we actually will get some run on it. Still a nice solid plane, too, after all these years. Now after one of these, these test run specials, you'll like the way this wax works, Russ. This is really nice stuff. Just wipe most of the oil off. Give it a nice healthy coat of this. I think you're ready to go flying. I'm ready. That sucker is ready, baby. Now I gotta tell you, the fish are not crazy about bench running engines in the yard here. See all the junk falling in the pond? Midgley's making me a big net to put over this pond. We don't have it yet, needless to say. Quit running those engines, Wendy, and feed us. We need food. Yeah, they're, they're fussy. They don't want to hear those motors run. Quit running those motors, you guys, and feed us. Now here's a dejected man. He can't even get the fish to take the food out of his hands. I got a net. I just bought a net. Kenny's got a fish tank down at his shop now even. Can't live without fish. There's just no way you can do it. Uh, it's springtime and everything's blooming behind the pond. All the little flowers are blooming. Summer's coming. It's flying season. Fits right in there, too. You have no trouble getting two of them in there. That's good. That, this is back at number nine or eight. Nice little foam pads, yeah. Nice deal. A good way if you got a store planes in a Jeep. Or, what is this, a Jeep? Jeep, yeah. And the little foam things on the tail. This is a great way to do it. Foam. Nice foam pad up here. Next Wednesday, they throw the couches away in town. We go out and get all the free foam. Well, I say. Get a new supply of foam for this, this year. Where this came from. <laughs> yeah, I know.
Now on the next tape, we have a really, really exciting project we're going to work on. We finally are going to get to do, finally, finally, Hunsberger's new plane and a new clear coat technique on the next tape. We're at the end. Thanks for joining us. Share the tape with your friends. And just remember, the whole purpose of everything, the whole purpose of life itself, ultimately is to have as much fun as you can.